Viand, uh, who is the uh, new uh, Director General for Trade in the European Commission. Um, she took over this position only a month ago, and this is her first official visit uh, to Washington, and CSIS is delighted to have her uh, here for, uh, to make uh, some opening remarks, and then uh, she and I will have a, a conversation that will touch on, on a number of issues, uh, and then we'll open it for, uh, uh, for your questions. Um, uh, Dr. Valen is, as I said, the Director General for Trade. Prior to this uh, position for the previous two and a half years, uh, she, she was the Deputy Chief Brexit Negotiator, uh, which had to be one of the more difficult jobs in uh, uh, in the uh, EU. I, I've told her that if we invite her back a year from now, we'll, we will ask her uh, which, who was harder to negotiate with, the British or the Americans. But um, right now, I think she hasn't had the job long enough to ask the question, and I'm sure we'll get a, we would get a polite answer. But uh, she has a, a, a history uh, prior to that of a number of positions of, uh, of significance uh, inside the uh, European Commission. As I uh, said earlier, one of my personal favorites is before she was the Brexit uh, deputy. She was a deputy director general for directorates E, F, G, and H uh, uh, in, the director, uh, in DG Trade. And so those of you that are European, I'm sure, know exactly what that means and how important that is. And I have no clue, but it certainly sounds uh, impressive. And she has... Um, uh, numerous uh, positions uh, going back, uh, well, more than 20 years uh, with the Commission. She has a uh, doctorate in political science from Tübingen University. Her PhD thesis was on the EC Common Transport Policy, a study in EU policymaking. Uh, and she also studied political science, economics, and English literature and linguistics at Freiburg University in Germany and at Cambridge. Uh, so it's a distinguished resume, a distinguished background, and with that, I'm pleased to ask uh, Dr. Vine to come and make some remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, uh, Bill, for your kind words and the friendly introduction. On what is indeed my first trip uh, to Washington in my new capacity as Director General for Trade of the uh, European Commission. And actually the purpose of this visit is uh, to listen and learn. So it's a bit of an irony that I start off by giving a speech. Um, but that's where we are and uh, I hope to be able to set out some expectations and uh, enter into a discussion with you about the overall orientation of where we are in world trade policy, but also in EU-US relations. But allow me to start not with trade, but with history. Because if we do not learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. In the words of the American economist and social theorist, uh, Thomas Sowell, one of the most important reasons for studying history is that virtually every stupid idea that is in vogue today has been tried before and proved disastrous before, time and again. So today I would like to share with you a few history, a few stories from history, ones which I think are particularly relevant to our discussion today. There are three historical events I would like to mention, and they are all linked by a common theme. They are the murder of an Italian envoy in London in 1379, a letter written by George Washington in 1796, and an unscripted scene in the 1986 movie uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So let's start with the murder of a trade negotiator in 1379. And my colleagues who are with me here today, like myself, are very happy that that seems to have gone out of fashion. So Giano Imperiale was sitting in the street, minding his own business. A man walked past three times, intentionally stepping on him. An argument broke out, swords were drawn, Giano was killed. Why? Because he was an envoy of the Italian government, a trade negotiator sent to access ports beyond London. Narrow interests did not want this, a group of wealthy Londoner middlemen. They got rich from the duties and profits of English wool exports. Giano's murder was part of a larger story of international trade. The monopoly held over the ports by these middlemen 
made sure fo uh, that trade was focused on one-to-one -one relationships with other ports, limiting imports, driving up prices, making the majority suffer. But eventually, barriers were lifted and other ports would open. The murder of Jarno could not hold back wider prosperity forever. George Washington's letter uh, of 1796 was to the American people, his farewell address. After 20 years of public service, he stepped down, but he wanted to speak to the people directly, addressing them as friends and fellow citizens. He reflected on the challenges America was to face and offered advice on how to take them on. The credo of his foreign policy section is a strong endorsement of free trade, that trade links should be established naturally, that there should be minimal interference from government, that common rules for international trade should be established. It is interesting, though, that this was not in line with the policy of his presidency. Maybe he saw the folly of protectionism at the end. Or perhaps it had something to do with other influences. The letter was published three years after Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations. And finally, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The actor who played a very boring teacher, Ben Stein, was too good at his job. He could not finish a scene without the class laughing. They told him to talk about the most boring thing he could think of to calm them down. He happens to be a real economist, so he delivered a monologue on the Hawley Smooth Tariff Act of 1930, and that did the trick, uh, the students stopped laughing. Today, it is of course well known that this sunk the US deeper into recession, and that indeed it was not a good idea to go down that road. So these seemingly unrelated three events I've quoted are bound together, together by one common theme, and that is the danger of protectionism. Today, we would do well to remember these lessons, not least because the decision we make now will affect the global landscape for years to come. So what is the view from the EU? It's not just trade disrupted. It's the entire global order that is in flux. Geopolitics, security, and technology are at the core of this change, and trade and economics have been dragged into this new reality. They've lost the relative independence they enjoyed before. Central to this transformation is the rivalry between the US and China on a geostrategic level and the competition for technological leadership. Trade is but the means by which this competition is carried out. So what does that mean for the EU? We are caught between China's state-led economic model with all the trade distortions uh, that that brings and market distortions that that creates in our home market, but also in third markets, as well as on the Chinese market. On the other hand, we have the US increasingly uh, 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 taking uh, unilateral measure measures. And against this backdrop, the EU wants to hold its own. We are determined to preserve and promote a rules-based international order with updated rules fit for the 21st century. Because the alternative is a world where might is right. Geoeconomics is a particular challenge for the Union, for the EU. Because the EU was built on the separation between trade and economics on one side and politics and security on the other. Today, we realize we have to up our game if we want to be rule makers and not rule takers in the world of today and tomorrow. So how to adapt? Assertiveness is the name of the game. There's no more room to be shy. Especially now, we choose the type of a world that we want to live in, making decisions that will affect generations to come. The EU has chosen its path. At home, we are becoming, becoming more assertive by protecting our market from unfair, disruptive, and illegal practices. We have stepped up uh, our uh, ability to use trade defense measures. We have set up an FDI screening uh, that looks at foreign investment in the EU to make sure that, it, that these investments do not uh, raise security or public order issues. Uh, we are promoting uh, 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 tools such as the uh, international procurement instrument uh, that gives us leverage to open up third country markets, etc. 
We are also bringing together our policies and making the best use of them, competition, industry, trade. Abroad, we are doing so too, standing up for multilateralism, enforcing the rules, ensuring a level playing field. And in this context, obviously, China springs to mind. The EU is not against the emergence of China, but we have a problem with the lack of convergence of China with the rest of the global order. In this respect, we share the US concerns about distortions from non-market uh, policies and practices. And that is behind our commitment, our engagement, together with the US and Japan in the so-called trilateral process, to try and develop rules to address this behavior. And we are also using our economic weight to make our voice heard. The EU stands for a market of 500 million people, and we want to leverage the size and the importance of this market in order to shape the global environment in a way that is conducive uh, to uh, uh, fair trading practices and sustainable development. We want to shape the world through connections and standard setting. We want to remain outward looking and engaged. As you know, we have had one of the most active trade negotiating agendas in the world. Over the last five years, we have completed negotiations with Japan, Canada, Mexico, South Korea, Singapore and Vietnam. And just last month, we concluded the negotiations after 20 years with Mercosur. Um, so what does this mean then for EU-US relations? The EU-US relationship is a central artery of the global economy and the largest trade and investment relationship in the world. It has the potential to be an incredible tool for leverage. We are already using it as such. Indeed, as I've explained, it has been central to our response to the unfair trading practices of China. The trilateral work in this context is extremely important, as I said, between the EU, uh, the US and Japan, to develop multilateral rules on issues such as industrial subsidies, state-owned enterprises, IP theft, or forced technology transfer. But let me be also clear, we want to anchor these rules in a multilateral environment, in a reformed WTO, because in our view, this is the only way to have lasting disciplines that can be enforced in a sustainable manner over the duration, independent of individual people in office. So that is what we are trying to achieve, and we, are, we want to work, we need to work with the US as a partner in this endeavor. But recently, our relationship has come under strain. Tariffs on steel and aluminium, the threat on cars, long-running disputes over aircraft subsidies. It is natural that friends sometimes disagree with each other, but this is something else. There are real threats elsewhere, I have referred to some of them, yet we find ourselves in a morale-supping, growth-slowing series of skirmishes. We have to overcome this. There is the political will to fix these issues, to choose cooperation over conflict. We can see that since the meeting between Presidents Juncker and Trump. They laid out a positive agenda for the EU and the US, and uh, the first anniversary is coming up later this week, and on that occasion, the EU will be publishing a progress report on what has been done uh, in the last year and how we see uh, the way forward. Let me just pick up a few themes uh, from this cooperation. A very important one is a global partnership on standards. The strategic case for the EU and the US of setting jointly standards in areas that are not yet regulated, but where regulatory efforts are underway, is overwhelming. It's today that we will set the standards for robotics or 3D printing for connected cars, and we want to do so jointly in order to be able to shape the global order in these uh, issues uh, in line with our uh, principles and ideas. There is also a strong business case for doing this. It is not extremely sexy, I recognize that. But reaching an agreement on conformity assessment and on standards reduces the cost of trade, reduces the cost of doing business and of complying with each other's rules. And uh, applied to a one trillion 
dollar bilateral relationship, these things make a real difference for business. We have also proposed to work together on industrial tariffs to eliminate them. That again would not only bring benefits for business, and they are far from being negligible. On both sides, we are looking at additional exports by 2033 in the order of $26 billion. But this would also build trust. And so would finding a settlement for the long-standing Airbus Boeing dispute. And the more we can do away with our bilateral uh, trade irritants, strengthen our bilateral cooperation, the more political energy and capital we can spend on dealing with the real challenges. And that is, how can we shape the global trading order, order in line with our values and principles? And here, perhaps, there is a difference between the EU and the US. The EU and its member states have learned the hard way that no single country in today's world is able to enforce its will or shape the world around it on its own. It needs cooperation. And we would argue that this applies even to the biggest country. So um, we need to work together on these issues. That is our number one uh, priority. Um, and we are committed to modernizing the World Trade Organization, actually going for a root and branch reform where this is necessary. Why are we so attached to the WTO? It is the only framework we have to achieve this. It is not perfect, it is in need of reform, but we are, we, if we, what is the alternative? Tearing it up and starting afresh? Do we have the luxury of time to build something totally new? I don't think so. We think that we need to maintain the functioning of the WTO. We need to review all its functions, from the negotiating function to the monitoring function to dispute settlement. Um, and uh, we, need to make it, we need to develop the rules to make it fit for the 21st century. We have already proposed a route to reform and we would want to engage seriously uh, with the US on this. We want to update the rule book to deal with issues like subsidies and forced technology transfer. We want to reinvigorate the negotiating function from fisheries to e-commerce, domestic regulation in services and investment facilitation. We want to ensure a proper functioning of dispute settlement because what is the value of rules without the means to enforce them? And that's why we want to unblock the appointments of the appellate body by addressing the concerns that have been raised by the US uh, as regards the functioning of that appellate body. And we want to overall improve the working methods of the organization. And we are not alone in this either. Japan is engaged with us in this process, and so are other countries. We have been making proposals, uh, reaching out to a large number of other WTO members. We are convinced that the best way to secure the benefits of global trade and the best way to rein in China in a fair and lasting manner is through a better WTO, one fit for the 21st century. So let me come back to where I started, history. What can we learn from history for this? I think we can learn that narrow interests gain from managed trade while the majority lose out that there is no protection in protectionism, that trade is about more than money, it is about influence and alliances, about politics and power, that it is better to reform than to relapse, and that in the long run, though it has undergone disruption, although the pendulum has swung back and forth, the march of progress is in the direction of open global trade. That is why the EU-US alliance is so important an alliance where we address our concerns through the rule of law, where we work together to set global rules through the WTO, an alliance where we curtail unfair practices from China and others, and where we secure the benefits of, global, of open global trade for another generation. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion.
Well, thank you for that. I want to get a, um, a copy of that later if I can. I'm going to, um, as some of you know, I write a column, and the, the one about the, uh, the trade negotiator <laughs> that, got, <laughs> that got killed, as a, I think I can use that in the future. So Don't give ideas to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want to encourage that kind of behavior, but I certainly understand it under some of the circumstances. Uh, what we'd like to do now is drill down onto some of the issues uh, that were just mentioned and others that we know are, are going on out there, some of them between the U.S. and the EU and others uh, more broad-based than that. And so we'll, the two of us will have a conversation for a little while and then we'll turn our attention to all of you and have plenty of time for questions for you. Let's begin with the obvious, which is the U.S.-EU relationship. Um, what, and you're here, among other things, to, to uh, discuss that with the anniversary of, of the Juncker-Trump agreement uh, coming up in a few days. Um, characterize for us where you see the negotiation right now, uh, particularly where, uh, are we in agreement on scope? Are we still arguing about, uh, about scope? Uh, is the, have you made any progress on the question of agriculture? Mm -hmm. Is that the only issue that divides uh, the two of us as far as scope is concerned, or are there others? Um, I think, as so often in life, there are different things. One is the public debate, where the issue of the scope is very much not settled. You refer to agriculture. Um, and then there is the actual work in the executive working group, yeah, which was set up and which obviously sticks to the mandate set by the two presidents. Um, and here the picture is a mixed one. I think we have actually uh, made some decent progress on uh, issues in the area of conformity assessment and regulatory cooperation, which as I said in my introductory remarks has a huge potential. Yeah. and where it is in the joint EU-US interest to set the global standards. Um, so I think here we are hopefully moving forward, but that is one of the things I will have to test when I meet my interlocutors uh, this afternoon. But here uh, we have made some progress on pharmaceuticals, we are cooperating on medical devices, but there are a lot of other issues out there where we can make more progress. We, have also, uh, 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 we are also working well together uh, on energy issues, LNG, yeah, which is, uh, which is a success story, which I think is in the interest of both sides. Where we are stuck uh, is on industrial tariffs. We have a mandate to negotiate the elimination of industrial tariffs, uh, but uh, there has not been much of a take up so far on the US side, so I'm interested to explore why this is the case and what can be done uh, to unblock this. Then there is another strand of this work which is extremely important and where again I think we need to move up a gear. Uh, we have been working at technical level but it needs to go to the political level now and that is on this whole issue of working together, uh, including with uh, Japan, but working together to reign in China and develop a system uh, in which China can function without distorting uh, markets around the world. So it's a very mixed picture, uh, some uh, progresses, uh, some areas uh, of promise, but where we need to step up, and on the industrial tariffs so far, um, not much movement. What has been the United States' argument about industrial tariffs? Are we just not interested in that? I'm um, surprised. I'm trying to find out. I have the impression that uh, there are people in the US administration who are more interested in raising tariffs than lowering them. Um, we'll get to are, that. <laughs> there are others who indeed say, I don't want to discuss industrial tariffs without discussing agriculture. Uh, uh, so and you, the European response to that has been what? Of course Europe we'll take up agriculture. The right? European re response to that is, we have a mandate uh, fixed by uh, the two presidents Let's work on that mandate, and it is not uh, the reason why agriculture is not is absent from that mandate. Is not that nobody thought about it at the moment. On the contrary, it was an issue of discussion. Uh, but President Juncker explained uh, why the uh, the EU was not able to do uh, much in this respect. 
we also have to be very clear that there are certain limits to what we can do in terms of an overarching agreement between the EU and the US at the moment. You are familiar with the discussions we are having in Europe about uh, FTAs being premised on uh, respect uh, of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, so that is an issue we need to keep in mind. Um, and uh, we have to be uh, clear, I mean, we, are, we have an authorizing environment composed of 28 member states and the European Parliament, and uh, we do not have a mandate from our member states to negotiate a comprehensive agreement, where, of course, in addition to agriculture, we would also find back the uh, TTIP favorites of uh, public procurement, maritime services, uh, etc. Well, so, uh, go ahead, sorry. Just one last remark, sorry. Um, I think rather than being hung up about questions of philosophy almost, I think we need in the current circumstances, we need to build trust by making progress on concrete issues. And we have the substance to do that. And then I think we can see where this process takes us over time. But I don't think that the fact that we have different concepts of what ideally should have been in the mandate uh, should prevent us from moving forward in the areas where we agree that we want to cooperate. Well, let me ask two questions about that. If the United States were to agree to put all those things like public procurement, the things that we don't want to talk about, if we were to agree to put them on the table, would you agree to put the other things on the table, like agriculture? Um, if we are in the business of discussing hypotheticals, does that mean that the U.S. administration would uh, rediscover its full commitment to the Paris Agreement and be willing to buy into that? One can always hope. Um, <laughs> but that actually, this raises a, a, a timing issue that um, maybe we could explore for just a minute. There is a new European Parliament as yep. of earlier this month. There's going to be a new commission, which is now mm -hmm. taking formation. Uh, is anything going to change? Do you have to get a new mandate? Could you get a new mandate or uh, with a new commission? Um, we are built, the EU is built on the principle of institutional continuity. So the mandate that we have remains valid. Uh, and that is a mandate we received from the member states. So there's no need uh, to change that at this stage. What is interesting, we are, not, of course, now in the process of preparing the arrival of the new team, including the new trade commissioner, etc. I cannot prejudge exactly the decisions they will take. But you can see a theme over the last few years, the last couple of years, which is reinforced in the political guidelines of the president-elect, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen. And I see two things there. One is the determination to leverage all policy instruments, including foreign policy instruments, uh, at the global level. And as I said, the strength of the internal market. And I think her background in international affairs and security matters is probably helpful from that angle. So I would expect the commission to see that it will be stronger on integrating different policy instruments. And the second is the strong focus on equipping the EU with the domestic instruments necessary to protect its own market and also to defend its interests, including in situations where others have recourse to uh, uh, unilateral measures or where they deny us the possibility to have access to multilateral dispute settlement. So a stronger focus, more robustness on uh, enforcement and defending the EU interests in a world where the rules-based system uh, is under threat. Any inside information you want to share with us on who's going to be the next trade commissioner? <laughs> uh, this would be purely speculative at, uh, at this stage. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think traditionally uh, the trade portfolio has been one which has been very much uh, coveted. So there is always, the, the president always has quite a choice of possible <laughs> candidates. And uh, I'm sure we will end up with a strong trade commissioner. That's all I want to say. I know a few of the candidates, but not all of them. Well, we'll be watching with great interest. <laughs> I think we know some of them, too, and are looking forward to <laughs> I think you may have seen some of them even in Washington. <laughs> yeah, from, from time to time, yes. Uh, and I don't think that, that uh, anybody would be, would be unwelcome. Mm. I, I mean, I think both we're just simply looking forward to the change. And, It'll be interesting to see. It, I mean, it is a government of continuity, uh, but it is also these are also governments of individuals. Yes. Um, we have a believe in continuity too, but you can see that we've undergone remarkable changes lately. Uh, 
Going back a step, uh, I was, uh, I think we all welcome the, the conformity assess assessment progress that you mentioned, and I mm -hmm. certainly agree and have written about how important that is in terms of, of, of cost savings, not necessarily in terms of altering the, the trade balance. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the reality is at the same time that, that uh, Europe and the United States have been arguing about uh, regulatory details for 40 years uh, on many issues uh, without much success. Uh, do you see any significant change there? Are we, we're sort of nibbling around the edges. Mm. Are we ever going to get beyond a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and into some of the core issues where it seems to me our objectives are the same. We both want safe cars. Mm. We both want clean air. You know, we, won't, we don't want toxic chemicals polluting the environment, yet we take significantly different regulatory approaches mm. to achieving what are really exactly the same objectives. Why can't we get closer together on these things? Mm. I think we have to uh, unpack that a little bit because there are lots of different issues in, in what you just said. One is indeed on uh, an agreement on uh, conformity assessment that makes it easier uh, uh, for people to certify that they meet the other party's uh, 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 standards uh, without having to undergo uh, uh, additional testing or additional certification. And that has an enormous impact. And here I think we now have the ingredients, but you know, I need to check that with my interlocutors. We think we have the ingredients to make an agreement that would apply across all sectors and would reduce compliance costs considerably. And I mm. think that would be uh, a very good result. So I think that should be, that from our point of view, that should be doable. Um, but of course, I mean, in terms of uh, saying, well, we all have the same policy objective, safe cars. So why can't we just agree on, you know, uh, accepting what uh, uh, each side is doing as good enough? Well, I mean, we do have totally different setups on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, liability and responsibility. Yeah. So mixing these systems, it's not so easy. And we have different institutional setup which reflects certain societal preferences. So the thing to, to work with that is basically on the standards and regulations themselves to start working together early. And that is most promising in areas where these standards are not yet set. It is much more difficult to try and undo what has been done and build something new where both sides have been regulating for 30 years. So, I mean, so that's why I think a focus on two things is helpful. The conformity assessment, which reduces compliance costs but doesn't touch uh, the respective uh, standards as such, and then work together on the development of new standards. And the point is, we don't have much time for that because the standards on, on, on robotics, on 3D printing, on connected cars, they are being set now. Uh, and there are other players who are very active in the international organizations that work on these standards. So I think here we have an urgent need to get our act together, together as EU and US. So um, this tells me no progress on chickens, one of my favorite subjects. But uh, I certainly agree, uh, it's, it's, it's much easier to address regulatory differences in new areas where there are not built-in institutional interests in maintaining the status quo. Uh, I think it's not gone unnoticed here in the United States that there's a number of those areas, uh, GDPR being one, uh, the digital services tax yeah. being another one, where Europe has, has not exactly moved multilaterally, but has basically been a first mover. Uh, in our view, at the expense of the United States. Uh, why should we have confidence in, in a multilateral approach when there's a growing number of these new areas where you've acted on your own? Well, again, I think we have to unpack this a little bit. Um, I would not put uh, 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 taxation issues or GDPR in the same box as uh, 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 crash tests for cars. You know, it's not, it's not of, the same, of the same nature. But to come back to your point, what do we do in areas where the standards are set and where both sides have regulated differently? Well, I think we need to have much more of a permanent dialogue on, uh, between the regulators on both sides, so bilateral cooperation, in order to make it easier to fulfill uh, each other's uh, requirements. So that is, still, that is a possibility also in areas where we are not starting from, from virgin ground in terms of, of, uh, of regulation. Now, 
on the issue of uh, GDPR, um, I think here we have to recognize that the societal preferences on both sides of the Atlantic are not exactly the same. I think in the EU we have much more of a, uh, of a public uh, concern about privacy. Uh, there have been prominent cases in uh, the European Court of Justice on that. Uh, we have had a long experience of trial and error in order to get to uh, public regulation uh, that meets our, our core principles. And we have to recognize that uh, Europeans are very attached to the idea that the individual owns his or her data. And that is what is reflected in the GDPR. Yes, it's a first mover advantage we had there. I recognize that. But we can also see that we, this is not uh, an obsession which we have in splendid isolation. We see that California is uh, following in the same direction. We also see that Japan uh, is considering legislation that goes into that direction. And if I look at the global level, uh, we've had in Osaka uh, this discussion about data free flow with trust. I think that is something we can work with. And that is something we now need to pick up in the digital trade negotiations uh, in Geneva, in the e-commerce negotiations. On the, tax, on the tax, I would disagree with you that we have uh, gone alone on this. Actually, this is exactly uh, what people want us to do vis-a-vis -vis China, i.e. we are aiming for international rules. That's what the OECD is working on. But we also see that that process may be a bit slower than we like it. So we create interim measures that show our determination to go for a fair taxation, whether we are talking brick and mortar or digital transactions. Um, and uh, 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 these measures are there as long as there's no international agreement uh, on how to tax uh, these in the future. Now, of course, these measures uh, have to stand up to scrutiny in the WTO. Uh, the US has expressed doubt uh, about uh, whether the French law, uh, in particular, is non-discriminatory. Uh, I think the place to address these concerns is the WTO. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, we, are, we are ready to, to discuss these issues. We are obviously convinced uh, that the measures are not discriminatory, but we are ready to discuss. Well, I think that answers my next question, which was uh, it'll clearly come to the WTO, I think, unless the OECD gets busy and, and preempts the discussion with uh, you know, a joint proposal that everyone can subscribe to, which would make this particular question moot. Uh, we will see. I, you know, the WTO test, as we learned in, in past cases, some of which the U.S. lost, uh, is what the, uh, not the intent, but the effect. Uh, and mm. I think that this is a case where the United States probably can demonstrate that the effect is going to be overwhelmingly on American companies. But, you know, there's only one way to see that, to figure that out, and that's to go through the process. And we'll get to the process in a minute. But going back to GDPR for just a second, um, uh, you mentioned the Japanese, you mentioned us, you didn't mention the Chinese. No. <laughs> who have taken a very, very different view on, on privacy. They seem to not believe in it, at least as far as mm -hmm. government access to data is concerned. Are you worried that we are moving in a direction of essentially a, a fragmentation of the internet where Europe is operating according to one set of principles, China, which is a very, very large market, is operating according to another set of principles. The United States may end up operating according to mm. a third set of principles, and we may be competing to bring other countries into our orbit, but that's not exactly a way to uh, maximize the, uh, at least the commercial aspects of, of digital trade. Um, I think there will be a competition uh, for regulation in this area. Um, and I would not exclude that there may, be, uh, there may be a certain fragmentation of the internet in this respect. The question is, how can we manage that if it comes to that? I think uh, we need to look at something like the tr digital trade negotiations in the WTO as an area to try and see whether we can establish at least some first principles that everyone can sign up to. And then I think we have to see how we organize exchanges between those who are willing to go further and where we can exactly 
do the trade-off between what are the reassurances we need in terms of building the trust, yeah, which then allow the free flow of data. So that basically you only exchange data in a free, uh, freely uh, between countries that have signed up to certain uh, 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 principles of, of uh, protection of privacy and data. So I think that will be the challenge, uh, but uh, I think there is a difference between a certain fragmentation of the internet, which you see already today, but it hasn't stopped the internet from functioning. Yeah, you already see that today. You already see when, as a European, you access an American website, uh, you have certain warnings on GDPR, or certain websites look different in Europe than they look in the US. Uh, that hasn't uh, paralyzed the system. What we need to be uh, careful about, though, is we need to avoid a situation where basically you have a total separation and uh, something like a, a Chinese wall in the internet. I think that would be more problematic uh, than a well chosen phrase, I think. <laughs> And, and uh, China is not the only country that no. is uh, uh, either has imposed or is contemplating much more serious restrictions on the cross-border transmission of data and, and the requirements for data localization. Um, let me go back uh, to uh, the more mundane for the moment because we uh, spent a lot of time here in the United States focusing, sadly, not on the industries of the future but on the industries of the past. Uh, what's your, uh, are you optimistic that uh, we're going to uh, not get into an automobile tariff uh, war with the, with the EU, or do you see tariffs coming? You're, the current uh, trade commissioner, as I recall, has said different things about that at different times. What's your current feeling about what Trump's going to do? I would not pretend to be able to anticipate Neither that. Neither would we, but I'm so, going to ask uh, anyway. I don't know whether I will have a better understanding of that after my trip and my meetings uh, today and tomorrow. Um, I think that the fact that there are different expectations and that expectations change with time are linked to the fact that uh, there are people looking at this from different angles. I personally think, or the EU thinks, that uh, getting into the spiral of measures and countermeasures is indeed <laughs> not a good way to go uh, about international trade, and it only creates losers on all sides. Yeah? And we see that with the uh, steel and aluminium tariffs, we were forced to take rebalancing measures. Uh, should uh, uh, the U.S. go down the road of uh, 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 imposing tariffs on uh, European auto exports uh, to the uh, U.S., we would be forced to do the same and also take rebalancing measures. So uh, it's a lose-lose scenario, and uh, I think our uh, objective as EU is to try and prevent that uh, and get to a situation where we develop the positive aspects of our bilateral relationship but where first and foremost we can focus our uh, energies on addressing the real issue that we face on the global stage. Another looming issue that may actually be bigger in dollar terms is the, uh, the Boeing Airbus dispute, mm. where we both lost uh, yep. at the WTO. Uh, my view is uh, you lost bigger than we lost, uh, <laughs> certainly in, in dollar terms. Both sides are busy producing potential retaliation lists. I think you've already done that. We are in the process of doing one that I think is going to be, in the end, $25 billion, which is way more than anybody has asserted. But it's a handy list, you know. Uh, what do you see the outcome there? The arbitrator in the U.S. case, I think, will shortly produce a number. Mm -hmm. I, my guess is not now, but after in September, I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably will be a number that's different from what either side has asserted, it usually is. Uh, but then I think that's the end game for this, that case, the tariffs, those, that retaliation will likely go into effect. Is that what you see happening? And what happens then? Uh, we wait to see what, uh, when you, the results of, mm. of your case and, and what that number is. Mm. That's another reply I have to start off by disagreeing with you. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. But, um, I mean, our assessment is not that these are two cases of different magnitude. Actually, our assessment is that they are more or less in the, that they are in the same ballpark. Uh, if you look at uh, the issue of uh, adverse uh, effect, which is what will determine the size of the, of the award. 
So we have two parallel cases. We have both lost, as you've said. We have both sides enriched law practices during 20 <laughs> years. Um, so uh, I, I think we should try our best to put an end to that. It's time to put this to bed also because we are no longer in the world in which we were 15 years ago where this was all about competition between Airbus and Boeing. But again, we have other people, other countries uh, getting onto the market uh, with uh, deeper pockets uh, and different ways of subsidizing. And I think from our point of view, the ideal outcome would be uh, to use the next uh, weeks and months to get to an agreement um, which sets out disciplines um, for the future um, and which uh, resolves uh, the, the issue uh, that way and that we do so uh, in a way which makes the imposition of or the suspension of concessions as it is called superfluous. Uh, we recognize that uh, once the award is out, of course, the U.S. is entitled under WTO rules to suspend concessions. So this is quite different from uh, steel and aluminium or the threatened car tariffs or what they are doing with China. So we recognize that. Yeah, we did it the right way for once, <laughs> basically. You said that, I didn't. <laughs> but uh, we recognize that they are entitled to do that. We are hampered by the fact that uh, our case uh, will take a few more months longer. Uh, but then our assessment is they are comparable and rather than going down the spiral again of uh, measures uh, on both sides, um, we would like to find a resolution to the issue yeah, and then make that uh, imposition of sanctions uh, superfluous. Now, of course, I recognize that there, has been, there have been voices in the U.S. saying, well, the moment we have the, uh, the uh, right to impose sanctions, we will do so. Um, that's something we will have to discuss um, because I don't think that it is in uh, uh, the U.S. interest to impose these sanctions because it will oblige the EU to do the same then uh, uh, a few months later um, and that is not conducive to a good negotiated outcome and it will not help business on both sides of the Atlantic. I assume that's an issue you're going to bring up today with your, when you meet with uh, your, your counterparts. You mentioned that there are other countries out there, yeah. uh, and there are a number of them, but one in particular, uh, at least down the road, not immediate, uh, is China, mm -hmm. uh, which has a history of, of massive subsidies to promote yeah. uh, uh, industrial objectives of its own, and this is probably a good example of that. Um, and uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, the EU has been involved in is the trilateral process with yeah. Japan and, and the United States as well to develop an approach for addressing uh, state-owned enterprises mm -hmm. uh, and non-market subsidies. Uh, bring us up to date, if you can, on, on where that exercise stands. Uh, is there going to be a, a result that will become public at, at some point? And mm. how do you move, once you have an agreement, presumably, how do you move on from, from then? Mm. I think um, we have been working constructively at technical level. Um, but we have not been that good in making the jump from the technical level to the political level. And that is something we need to look at um, because these issues are ripe now for textual proposals. Uh, and as I said, the technical groundwork has been done. The real discussion that's still to be had is to see what exactly are we uh, trying uh, to achieve. We need to have ambitious rules, but rules which are also negotiable. Uh, you can also put the ambition so far out there that nobody will follow you. So you can also kill a process by being over ambitious and propose rules which are not negotiable. So I think we need to, to fine tune the level of ambition uh, with what we consider negotiable. That is something which is a political assessment that has to be done at political level. And we hope that as of September we would be able to have that political discussion. Uh, and then uh, bring, this, uh, uh, bring this forward, bring this to the WTO, uh, but uh, uh, also then uh, pull together the forces of the US, the EU, and Japan uh, to leverage uh, our joint uh, uh, 
you know, markets in order to persuade others to sign up to these uh, agreements. Has, has the EU been talking to the Chinese about this, or are the discussions entirely amongst the three countries at this point? The Chinese are perfectly aware of this process uh, 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 taking place. <laughs> Because we're telling them or because they're listening in? What is it? <laughs> no, 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 no. We have also been uh, transparent with them that ah. this is going on. So uh, that is not a surprise. Um, I think for the moment they do <laughs> not have to position themselves because it is not yet out there. So that is why it's so important that we really produce now text-based results of this work, uh, that this gets endorsed at the political level and that then this is something which will uh, 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 oblige uh, China to position itself, because at the moment they have not been forced to do so. As long as the result is not there, they are in a comfortable position. That brings us to um, the WTO, which mm -hmm. I know is an issue of, of great importance to the Commission uh, and also here. Uh, let me uh, ask a couple of questions. Let me start with some specific ones and then uh, work our way up to the bigger picture. Uh, you, you commented earlier about the uh, e-commerce negotiations. Mm -hmm. Can you say a word about, about fisheries and how mm -hmm. optimistic you are about uh, uh, getting that done in time for the, the ministerial 11 months from now? That yeah. is the main goal, I think. Well, fisheries. I think it's the only uh, live multilateral negotiations. E-commerce and others are plurilateral, so do not involve the whole membership. Um, and I think it is very important that we actually get to a result here. Um, now, what we see is that the degree of preparedness is not the same across the whole scope of the negotiations. And actually, we, are, we have an even more challenging uh, deadline because uh, these negotiations are supposed to be finished by the end of the year. Now, if I look at the papers uh, that were agreed as the basis for the further negotiations uh, last week, uh, you can see that on issues like uh, uh, IUU, uh, so the illegal, unreported, uh, undeclared uh, fishing, um, we are more advanced, and on overfished stocks, we are more advanced than on the, on the issue of uh, subsidies contributing to overfishing and overcapacity. So we will have to uh, consolidate uh, what we have in these areas, yeah, while then uh, uh, moving forward on the areas that lag behind. And perhaps at least by the end of the year, we can say, okay, on IUU and overfished stocks, we are basically there, but of course nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Uh, and then uh, move forward on the rest uh, with a view to MC12. But I think in the autumn, we will have a clearer picture of where we, we can go there. Now, the U.S. is very much engaged in these negotiations and has very much pushed for that, uh, which is good. Uh, uh, but I think this will require, also on the U.S. side, on our side, uh, a, uh, a lot of heavy lifting in order to really get this into a space where we can look at an agreement. There are two other disputes that I'd like to ask you about ongoing. Uh, one has faded a bit. Maybe you can make a sort of an historical comment, and that's the, uh, uh, the market economy status case between the EU yeah. and China, which uh, the rumors are that uh, you won, China lost. Uh, the case then mysteriously disappeared and may never appear in public. Mm -hmm. uh, is, that, uh, is that true, what the outcome was? I'm looking at my lawyers, but I think I'm not supposed to comment in public on, a case, on a case that has been uh, um, sort of put to rest in the WTO. But you don't, think, you don't seem worried. Um, in the meantime, we are confident that uh, uh, our renewed methodology in TDI uh, works. We have been applying it for a while now. We will continue to apply it. By the way, it's an area where we have had constructive cooperation and exchanges with the U.S. Uh, right, so because we're next. You know? <laughs> if, if, you had no, lost, if you had lost, we would have been, we would have been next. So <laughs> yeah. we dodged a bullet thanks to you. Uh, there is also, of course, uh, a different one, which is more complicated, where we're not on the same page. And that's the, uh, the 232, the steel and aluminum yeah. tariff uh, disputes, where many countries uh, and, and, and the, the, the EU have brought complaints against the United States. 
uh, there was an adjudication on this issue in, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, which I'm sure you know well where Russia uh, won. Uh, what, do you, what is the timeline that you see for, that, for the American cases, and what do you think the outcome is going to be? Ooh. I don't have a crystal ball, seriously. I think this is one of uh, the cases where we have come to a negative truce, because there are the American measures, there are counterbalancing measures, and in the meantime, the litigation continues, which I don't think is a very satisfactory state. Um, but you know, that, that, is, uh, that is exactly the negative spiral we would like to avoid uh, repeating on uh, issues like cars or others. But I can't tell you, I don't, I don't have an insight into the timeline of any of these cases. I think our assessment here at CSIS anyway has been that, uh, <coughs> similar to the Boeing Airbus case, there are there is parallel litigation going on. I think we're probably both going to lose. Uh, and that then brings us to the, the, the issue of the appellate body. Yes. Uh, because I think this is a case where if we lose, uh, either side loses, the, the, te the temptation will be to appeal, uh, which if nothing else will drag things on for another uh, you know, year or so. Yet uh, we may face a situation relatively soon where that is not really an option because the appellate yeah. body is going to go away. Um, the e EU seems to be busy creating an alternative to the appellate body uh, using Article 25. Can you say a few words about that and how that's going? Uh, do you have any traction or not? Um, I'm making a habit of this. I will start by disagreeing with you again. <laughs> um, no, I mean, we, we are seriously worried about uh, the dispute settlement system. Uh, basically uh, stopping As are we. functioning. Maybe not our government, but yeah. you know. Uh, because obviously the uh, disappearance uh, of the appellate body has wider repercussions. Uh, because uh, if uh, after the 11th of December, when there's only one appellate body member left, uh, people can appeal uh, into the void, uh, it paralyzes the whole dispute settlement system. So in that situation, also the first stage of the system is unlikely to uh, uh, survive for a long time or to, be, to, be, uh, to re lead to results. So we are seriously engaged with uh, the Walker process, which is an attempt, uh, more than an attempt, which is a process that addresses the concerns raised by the US concerns which we may not necessarily agree with, but that doesn't matter. We still can think that we can clarify uh, a certain number of rules to make sure that the system functions in the way it was intended to function when it was set up. Because the US uh, argument is to say that the system has strayed from that and that it needs to be brought back to that. If that is the objective, actually what we are seeing from the Walker process, so the, the, the New Zealand ambassador chairing the dispute settlement body, um, is an honest attempt and a serious attempt uh, to uh, deal uh, with these issues. And that should, that is the plan to unlock the appointments in the appellate body. Now, obviously, given that we are just a few months ahead of the possible demise of the system, we thought we cannot sit idly by and see whether this works or not. And therefore, we have not looked at an alternative to the system because uh, our objective, there's only one plan, and the plan is to get the system back up and running again. Uh, but what we are looking at is to say, okay, if after December you can't hear any new cases because there's no appellate body, um, then you need to have a stopgap solution. And we want that stopgap solution to mirror the appellate body functioning but to be based on a provision on arbitration, which is part of the dispute settlement. It's just that we go about that in a more structured manner so that uh, you have a bilateral web where two of agreements between the two WTO members where they say, okay, uh, in disputes between us, either a concrete given dispute or the pipeline of current and future disputes, um, uh, we, uh, uh, we, come to, we, we, we come to the situation where we would have to have recourse to the appellate body. We replace that by an arbitration mechanism. Uh, and the arbitrators would be drawn uh, from uh, previous members of the appellate body. 
uh, they would be serviced in the same way uh, and would be able uh, to stop the gap until the applet body is back up uh, running again. Um, this is something where we will, uh, we are actually in the process of finalizing such a bilateral administrative agreement with Canada uh, later this week. Uh, we are in contact with other countries, but it is, as I said, not an alternative to the applet body, it's a stopgap solution. Uh, which would disappear the moment the applet body is up and running again. Uh, for us, what is extremely, as I said, we are moving a long way to address uh, the US concerns, although I still have to see whether responding to these concerns is indeed what the US wants and what would lead it to unblock the appointments to the applet body, or whether the objective is really rather to see the applet body system, uh, uh, the applet body disappear, and uh, return to the GATT 1994. Um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely clear, uh, but in any case, uh, we have the beginnings of a, uh, more of them than a beginning, we have the solutions with the Walker Report on the table, and hopefully that should uh, do the trick. Well, I have a lot more, but it's time to turn to the, to the audience. Jeff, please uh, wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and ask a question. Okay, don't give a speech. I promise no speech. Uh, Jeff Rathke, President of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. Um, uh, you talked a lot about linkages, about assertiveness, uh, and about instruments. And so I wanted to ask two questions related to that. Uh, the first is, in listing some of the new instruments the EU has, you mentioned the investment screening mechanism, which is, as far as I understand it, really only a transparency mechanism that doesn't have any, uh, any teeth in it at the EU level. Um, so taking that perhaps as an example, are there new instruments you believe the European Union needs uh, in order to better protect its instruments? And would those be achievable before November 1st when a new commission takes office? The second question is, um, you, you, you talked about automobile tariffs. Does the United States face um, a decision, either we uh, impose automobile tariffs or we work with the European Union to deal with China and WTO reform issues. In other words, is this an either-or um, uh, choice from the EU's point of view? If the U.S. imposes automobile tariffs, does that uh, threaten, endanger the EU's cooperation with the United States on these other reform um, issues? Mm. Uh on, on the first issue, uh, the FDI screening is, is basically built on the instruments that exist already in member states. And on that basis, we will develop the rules that we need in order to then deal with the consequences. So you have to look at this as one instrument, a step, which will have to be back, backed up by uh, the concrete measures. Then look, have a look at our China communication, where there are a number of initiatives announced where we would strengthen our domestic uh, uh, tool set. Now, this is something we are working on as the civil servants, uh, and which will be ready for when the new team takes over so that they can then take the political decision of uh, where exactly they want to put the cursor, what are the initiatives, their priorities, they prioritize what they want to take uh, forward. And uh, I will not announce now all the things we are working on because it is not my place to prejudge the political decision still to come. Uh, but if you look at the political guidelines of uh, uh, the president-elect, uh, you can see references, for instance, also to situations where we would have to be able to use sanctions in case we are denied recourse uh, to the dispute settlement system. So that is just, that gives you a sense of direction uh, of, uh, of what we need to do and that we need to have tools in order to enforce ruling. So the whole enforcement theme is very strong and we are working on a menu of options uh, from which the political level then uh, can choose. Um, on the uh, auto issue, um, I mean, it, it's not, we are not in the business of uh, say, well, we have, we have set, we have a cooperation agenda, which was decided by Presidents Juncker and Tusk. And that cooperation agenda also includes a commitment not to introduce uh, trade restrictive measures as long as this process is ongoing. 
our intention is to stick to that. And uh, I do the US the courtesy to assume that they do that as well. But it is also clear that uh, it is complicated to manage in parallel a process of uh, a, a positive agenda of constructive engagement, be that bilaterally or multilaterally, and at the same time pile up irritants in the bilateral trade relationship. So, you know, you cannot, it, it, it necessarily has an impact on the overall uh, atmospherics and the capacity to deliver on the positive track. But we are not in the business of uh, saying, if you do that, then we do that. Because our objective is to avoid a tit-for-tat approach. Here in the seven row. Uh, Robert Marin, Distilled Spirits Council. Thank you so much for joining us this morning um, and for your comments about the negative impact tit-for-tat countermeasures can have on both the US and the EU. Um, we, the Distilled Spirits Council, um, and our counterparts in Europe are jointly in strong opposition to any tariffs on the spirit sector. Um, uh, we've been working very hard since last year when the additional tariffs, countermeasures, whatever you want to call them in Europe, were applied to American whiskeys. We've seen a 19% decrease in exports since then. Um, we are very concerned with the potential escalation in the Boeing Airbus dispute. So I wanted, what I wanted to ask you, if you could share any insight um, into the EU strategy to de-escalate de the trade dispute specifically with regards to um, the dis dis distilled spirit sector. Thank you. Um, we are, tr as I said, one of the objectives of my visit uh, here in Washington is to see whether we have the ingredients of a deal that would put the Airbus Boeing dispute to bed, and then that would make uh, uh, the suspension of concessions on both sides superfluous. Um, but we are not in the business of uh, uh, discussing uh, 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 sanctions lists uh, with each other. So we are not going to do a specific uh, intervention in favor of one sector or the other. What we are trying to do is to get to a situation where neither side uh, would have to uh, suspend concessions because let's keep in mind the objective of suspending concessions in uh, this situation is to uh, induce the other party to comply with the WTO ruling. Well, it is our intention to comply with the WTO ruling uh, and to do more than that, uh, to agree disciplines for the future. And if we do that, then hopefully the case for any suspension of concessions uh, goes away. Um, but you know, but that is the way we approach it. I will have to see what the what the U.S. position is on this. Right here. Hi, Brett Fortin with Inside U.S. Trade. Um, on the autos report, the, the EU's position on the legitimacy of of um, auto in auto parts imports being a threat to national security has been clearly stated. Um, but if it's if the if this administration is treating um, the auto report like it did the steel and aluminum report, um, there's the idea that there's a pay for to avoid tariffs. Um, I've heard rumor that that pay for is dealing with agriculture um, in in the bilateral trade talks. Um, whether that whether or not that's a um, clearly spoken um, intent is kind of up uh, up for question. Is, is it your understanding that there is a pay for to uh, avoid auto tariffs or that there has to be some concession on the European side, whether or not it's a, an agreement to um, kind of a, a voluntary um, import restriction or something Sorry, along those sides? Uh, like a, a voluntary um, restriction of, of certain oh. um, <laughs> European auto exports or if it could be something like agriculture or if there's any type of um, concession that is, is seen as required from the EU side? Um, I think the EU position in general has been expressed many times uh, by uh, uh, the Trade Commissioner but also the Commission President uh, and that mm -hmm. is uh, we will not uh, negotiate under the threat of WTO illegal action nor will we go down uh, the road of managed trade um, so uh, that is what I can say in, in, in response to your question. And otherwise, we have a positive cooperation agenda uh, where we are moving forward. 
uh, for my taste, a little bit too slowly. We can do more there. Uh, but we are not going to negotiate uh, under threat of uh, 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 illegal sanctions, which is the difference between uh, possible automobile action and uh, the Airbus Boeing case. All right. We have time for one more, and there it is. Hi, I'm Ed Bristol with the American Chemistry Council. Uh, thank you for your remarks today. Uh, appreciate the focus on avoiding tit-for-tat tariffs. That's been a major focus of the chemicals industry in the United States. Uh, we're being hit on all sides by uh, U.S. tariffs, retaliation by the EU, retaliation by China, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm curious as to whether uh, you think it's possible to avoid more tariffs in the U.S.-EU discussion in the current context of the negotiations, um, you know, particularly with respect to Boeing Airbus, where chemicals are a, a prominent feature of the EU list and also on the e US list. Thank you. As I said, I can only talk about what our intention is, uh, but I cannot uh, anticipate the result. And uh, so this is something we will have to see uh, over, over the next uh, days and weeks. Uh, uh, but uh, we think we, we, are, um, we are ready to enter uh, into uh, negotiations of a, uh, of a settlement uh, that would make the imposition of uh, sanctions superfluous. That's all I can say. I do not control uh, 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 the U.S. action in this respect. I can only discuss with them. Well, on that note, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vine, and please uh, thank her for her graciousness and her uh, responses. <laughs>